I love that you are like, okay, well, I, I figured this out a little bit, but it seems like you're moving so fast that do you get a chance to like look back on what you're doing and kind of recollect? Or are you just constantly driving forwards? No, I can't look back because the thing is that I can't, uh, I, um, I can't watch what I've shot for a start. Oh, you don't watch it? I- Oh man, um, I was I was just telling you that I haven't been able to sleep, knowing that I'm talking with you. I've watched all your films. I've like studied all of your films. Uh, your work is such an inspiration to me, uh, as a as an artist, as a creative, as a human being. So I'm just so yeah, I'm really humbled to be in your in your presence right now. So it's kind of taking me a minute to process, honestly. So thank you so thank much. You, for being well, here. You know, as <laughs> coming from men so talented, that means a lot. Uh, so I appreciate uh, it. Thank you. Uh, Why well, it's, uh, it, yeah, I, I, I'm, I have a hard time taking, taking compliments for those that are listening. I have a, I'm getting over a cold and there was no way I wanted to reschedule this cause I know how busy Greg is and I didn't want to just, uh, be like, hey, I'm sick and then we would not be able to do it for a while. So, um, so I apologize for my hoarse voice. So yeah, Greg, I've watched your movies. Obviously I watched a lot of your work. I tried to find a lot of your shorts as well, which I thought was wonderful. Um, and then I wrote down a bunch of questions and I listened to a lot of other, other interviews. I think for those that are unfamiliar with you, it might be good for them to understand kind of where you come from. A lot of people that listen to this podcast are professionals, but they're also students. So it'd be really cool if you could kind of explain where you come from the part of the world and kind of, I know you didn't go to film school and you're a little bit unconventional, which I think lends to your amazing style and approach. Um, well, thank you, man. <laughs> this is going to be mean, accolades I, all day long. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I grew up in Melbourne in Australia, which is the, you know, pretty Southern part of Australia, pretty far down the world. Um, you know, I kind of was a, a kind of a bumbling art student for a while. I can't draw, I can't screen print. I can't really do much in the art world, but I, but I seemed to, uh, I had a desire to do something in the art world, but I just had no skill. Um, and I discovered photography, which was a, uh, combined technical and, and artistry, which I, I found, I, I, I just fell into really easily. Um, and I, and work, had to work hard to, to, to improve. And, but, but I, th- found that I was very inspired by photographers. Um, you know, in that particular time in the world, there was, uh, it was film only, there was no digital really. So, um, you know, there's some of the, the work of great Australian photographers like David Moore and Max Dupain and, um, Bill Henson, Bill Henson who, right. yeah, very controversial. I studied, very, I studied very, very you. Good. Yeah. Very yeah, controversial, but exactly. I see the where I see the way the light works, uh, how the painting of soft light, um, exactly. Like influence, which is beautiful. So okay. there's a lot of, a lot of inspiration close to home where I could go, ah, that's a job I could do because those mm-hmm. guys have done it. Those guys have taken, you know, photography to the next level in, in art or in photo, photo realism or documentary or so, um, I kind of worked quite significantly on that, but also as an aside was doing media studies at the time as well. And enjoying cutting things together on VHS. Now mm-hmm. when you're 16, 17, it's a bit of a, you don't really know what you want to do at that point in time. If you'd ask me, I'd probably said I wanted to be a guitarist in a band. Oh yeah. Know? And <laughs> did I mean, you play I, music I was, at the time? I mean, <laughs> I, I thought I did. I thought I was really good. Look at you landing these incredible opportunities in life. And then this, this odd start, this is so good for people to hear. So yeah, I thought it was amazing actually, <laughs> but uh, no, I wasn't. I just listened to my demo from years ago and it's, it's not uh, anyway. Yo, guitar? I, I'm glad I, yeah, yeah, I, I sold all my guitars to buy cameras when I went oh, to college. Wow. So that was a smart move. I clearly made the right decision. <laughs> Didn't see wow. a, a music career on my, in my future. It's um, almost like a christening through life selling one thing, one interest for the next. It's always a sad yeah. time, but yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I remember time, yeah. saving up for that guitar and being really sad when I had to sell it, but I sold it for a good reason. Anyway. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. So I sort of I sort of blended those two photography and media, but then decided to become a photographer and, and study photography in Melbourne. And, stills, um, right? Stills, photography. stills photography at RMIT. Um, mm. You know, I failed my first year because I was a screw up, and they almost kicked me <laughs> out. And I played with them not to. And anyway, this is the boring long version. You have a big family, uh, siblings in Melbourne? No, no small, no, small, small family. Yeah. Okay, yeah, okay. Um, I knew a lot of people with big families. I'm not. Mm. I'm not a. I have a lot of Greek and Italian friends who have very big families because sure. Melbourne is a very big Greek and Italian influence. Oh yeah, um, I've heard about that. Yeah. Uh, so you know, uh, <laughs> failed <did> photography. Okay. <laughs> almost failed. Well, almost failed. Almost was kicked out. Decided that that was. I wanted to go back to it, and it did. But in the midst of that, I joined a. a, a film production company called Exit Films, which was photography and film. And I was joined as a cleaner. I became a cleaner at their place. What is and that? Just cleaning the place? Yeah, toilets. Toilets, <laughs> floors, kitchen wow. sinks. In fact, I'm really good at dishwashing uh. dishes, coffee cups. <laughs> because of this job? Yeah, I got really good at it because everybody <laughs> drank so much coffee. I know this had to just, yeah. yeah, the um, film industry is fueled by caffeine. Yeah, that's right. So I joined this film production company that made made commercials, and um, there's some amazing directors that have come out of Exit Films. And I joined there as a, as a cleaner and started to get friendly with some of the directors and started to, you know. And at that point in time, I figured out that our photography wasn't my thing. Photography is a very solo profession. It's a very insular yeah. solo profession that that people I found at that point doesn't necessarily mean it's the case now. I've met various photographers along the way who aren't like this, but I found that photography was kind of an insular. Um, self-obsessed profession where everybody in Melbourne was kind of sort of battling for the same work. And I, and I feel like that's maybe across the board is that, mm-hmm. that at that level, it feels like everybody's kind of, you know, scrounging for the for the scraps of the photography work that, that, that's out there. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's universal. And, yeah, I think so. But <laughs> But beyond that, it wasn't fun because it was insular and I was the guy that did everything and it wasn't that I'm lazy and I, I could of course do, do everything, but I didn't want to do something by myself. But what was great about the film business is that, you know, you're a part of a team, you know, you're, you're one plus one equals three or four or five or 10 or nine, right. depending on the team, but you can bring something to someone else's idea that elevates it and they can bring something to your idea that elevates your idea and, mm-hmm. and you both end up looking better because of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and you, your product ends up being better because of it. I heard that so, about Steve Carell. I mean, you worked with him, but I heard that on set, mm-hmm. he was all about pushing the crew, everybody elevating, like push. I don't know if that was uh, how it was on Foxcatcher, but I, I love the office. It's one of my favorite shows. And I just heard that he was always a uh, supporting the team. Like he would take the back seat to make the other person funnier because he knew that yeah. was made the show funnier. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, it's a, it's a master, it's a masterful approach. I think that doesn't surprise me about Steve, you know, and on Foxcatcher, obviously it was a very different film to, um, yeah. to the office. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Wait, what? I mean, yeah, <laughs> pretty yeah, yeah. similar. Yeah. No, That's what she said, um, you know? So, yeah. <laughs> but, but what I did find was his, his, uh, his attention to detail was very high. You know, you, mm. you, you might see him as being a bit of a, bit of a clown, I guess on something like the office, but he's sure. incredibly hard worker. He's incredibly, I mean, I've worked with him now twice. And he was the mm. same on um, on Vice as he was. Vice on, is right, on yeah. God, he was incredible in Vice too. He was. Yeah, it, it, it's like sorry to interrupt. It's 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 hard for me to process all of the things that you have been through, and it's so cool to understand that. And we'll get back to it, obviously, but it's cool that you started out as a janitor. <laughs> the irony is oh, so right, brilliant. The that's right. In America, it's called a janitor. I forget that. The cleaner. cleaner. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you're, yeah. you're, you're networking at Exit Films, right? Meeting the directors uh, and you're finding that you like to collaborate more rather than be solo uh, photographer. Yeah. I mean, I was watching what they do and I was watching them work with their cinematographer and, and I was so watch, cool, watching huh? them work. And, but I didn't realize there was a thing called a cinematographer at that point in time. That's the thing. Like <laughs> I didn't know that's a job, you know, yeah. and cause everybody knows what a photographer does. Everybody yeah. knows what a director does or they think they do. Um, <laughs> yeah. but I had no idea that was a job. Until yeah. I met some cinematographers and watched them and went, ah, oh, that's what I do. And, but they have people to help them do stuff to focus on what they need to do. They have grips, gaffers, focus pullers. They have AC. They have 
um, people to concentrate on all the technicals. So I didn't have to become a, a, a technical, technically good. I, well, that's not correct. I didn't have to become technical at, at the tools. <laughs> sure. I had I've heard you say that, that many times, which I think is really inspiring too, that you're not super nerdy about the tech stuff. I think you have such a good unit of people that can take care of that. You can be more of an artist, which makes your work so much more pure. Is that right? <sighs> I mean, I, I potentially yes. I do think that there is a balance to be struck as a cinematographer sure. about being knowledgeable about the equipment that's in front of you, mm. understanding why it's better or worse that's in your right. opinion, mm. um, and then having the capacity and the brilliance, or the brilliance, the the foresight to be able to say, well, just because this variable is better than. It's it's not better for this project. I mean, I remember when um, I remember when the Alexa came out. I remember uh, I did a film called Snow White and the Huntsman in about mm-hmm. 2012. Yeah, That's right. Yeah. Rupert, I want to talk yeah. about Rupert because Rupert has an incredible. I worked with Rupert, and Rupert's how I got on Batman actually. So, which is uh, Rupert's kind of okay. a conduit to a lot of us. And you worked on like a Halo commercial with him a while back too, exactly. which is brilliant exactly. as well. And I remember how important like that was really impactful when that came out as well. So, but yeah. Snow White and the Huntsman. Well, we did um, we did some digital versus film tests, and they were the days of like the Alexa having had just been used. I think Roger had just used it in, in time, and I think yeah. a few other people had just used an Alexa. And the Red yeah. One was out. Uh, oh, you know, yeah. Remember, four yeah. K. That's right. Red One isn't four K great. Kind of a paradigm just, shift in the digital space, right? When 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 people like Roger, like um, were using this new tool and kind of. Everybody was like, you know, on two sides of the fence, but you start to see that it starts to blend, right? The quality. It, it, was, a, it was an interesting time because the thing is that obviously I believe Roger's um, impact was great because he chose to embrace that on those on those films. Yeah. Um, but I think what he discovered, and I think he would be too humble to ever admit that he was a <laughs> conduit to, to digital getting up because I think he'd probably say probably what I'd, say about other bits of tech it's like yeah. it's going to get up anyway that's right it's either i'm ahead of the curve or behind the curve that's right and if it's you don't use it just for the sake of being ahead of the curve you use it because it's the right tool for the job so but when we tested that was the that was the, the i remember knowing all the information about each of these these devices red alexa film and realizing that just because technically something might have more x y and z or something might be more like this or doesn't necessarily make it the better tool for the job. And right. how do you know um, that? That's one question I had. Um, I mean, every project's different. Your style, your approach. Like I watch you pre Lion, then I watch you post Lion, and I see how much Lion had an impact on you. This is just an observer. Mm-hmm. The way that you were like, well, I don't have this system. I have a system, but I, I'm using LEDs and I'm just using the light that I'm given. And I'm just, I don't know if that's the case, but it seemed like you <laughs> pared things down and really got to the core of it and then that's such a I cried my eyes out in that movie when I watched it, it was that's what you, that's the highest compliment you can give to a film when it makes you moves it you is. emotionally that it is yeah it's such uh, a brilliant film you all everybody in, involved in that film is just outstanding but I don't know this is just my interpretation when I, you know I have a lot of conversations outside of all these things like yeah. how does that work or I see your style as it changes and shifts you know um just your use of light, how you paint the light too, which is really beautiful. I mean, it's an interesting observation. I can't, I can't confirm or deny that that's the case because I, I don't know. I, I, you know, <laughs> moving too fast. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> maybe I don't, I don't know because I know that in that year I shot Lion and then I shot Rogue One, two diametrically opposed films. <laughs> that, yeah, you know, <laughs> but both so stunning and so. Um, yeah, but there, I, I don't know, from an outside observer, an image maker, and seeing the way that you're using light, I don't know, I feel like there's a, a strong synergy between the two, just as an observer, um, which is, it's it's just beautiful image making, really, so. <laughs> well, light, light is mandatory, light's a thing that I need to, well, something has to be lit well, otherwise it, I, I don't sleep, like I, I can't right. go home at the end of the day and just go, oh. <laughs> like I can't watch things that aren't lit well. I can't, you know, I can't watch things that Same. aren't that aren't real. That aren't, don't feel. Right. I mean, and go back to the office for a sec as a TV show. Like yeah. the office is, I mean, it's, it's set in an office, but it feels mm. like it's set in an office. It feels real. It feels honest. Yeah. You know, all the zooms I mean, of stuff. course, 
yeah, Lions not going to look like that. Rogue One's not going to look like that. <laughs> well, you Box wouldn't want to. Is not look like that. No, yeah. but well, whatever it is, yeah. it's honest. So, yeah. Yeah. Frog Sketcher felt like a Rembrandt painting. I don't know if that's yeah. intention, but it's it's got such a nice tone to it. Such a beautiful tone. And the the lack of light is oftentimes the so much more than light. You know, it's like how much you extract and how far you can go away from it, you know, which is really brilliant. This is your language, of course, I'm sure. But it's like, I just find it fascinating. And I love watching from Zero Dark Thirty, these different disparaging, almost completely opposite places, which I find I love as a creative to see other creatives throw themselves into the unknown. It, that's what it seems like to me. I could be wrong, mm-hmm. but I love that you are like, okay, well, I, I figured this out a little bit, but it seems like you're moving so fast that do you get a chance to like look back on what you're doing and kind of recollect or are you just constantly driving forwards? No, I can't look back because the thing is that I can't, uh, I, um, well, I can't watch what I've shot for a start. Oh, you don't watch obviously it? I, no, obviously I have to grade it and I have to work on it. Yeah. Um, and I have to sometimes go to the premieres, which is fine because I have to watch it. <laughs> when you sit but in I the can't. seat, are you just like, oh, <laughs> or do you, are you happy to just bring back memories? Because a creator is a different from an audience member because you can't, all you see is memories of the, on the day that shit happened or some other crap happened and you're like, oh no, like you're, you know, you're processing all of this chaos, I'm sure. I, I don't know how it must be. Um, yes, you do. Definitely the first day or first two or three times you watch it, you definitely have that. Mm. Um, but then, you know, occasionally I find myself like if I'm on a plane watching the guy ahead of me watching <laughs> Batman, I'm going, yeah. oh, okay, so that's soon. Yeah, cool. Yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> All right, that's good. Yeah. yeah, now I might put it on and just skip through it and just have a little look just as a reference, just to remind mm. myself how it looks, for example. How does that feel sure to be that- on a plane and see your work? completely misrepresented on the back of a seat with the, the light of the cabin coming in and stuff. How, how does that feel? I mean, it's, a, it's the same as when I went to see Zero Dark Thirty and <laughs> the cinema in Santa Monica had lifted the levels of the entire movie because the oh. end was so dark. Oh. So I, I had to leave after 15 minutes because it every scene sick. was brighter and I knew that, oh. that why they'd done it. And I complained to the manager mm. and he went, people have complained that it's too dark. I'm like, uh, oh, all right. It's got dark in the name, man. <laughs> I mean, too dark at the end. That was the whole point. I said I didn't say this. I didn't have a debate with him, but I was like, sure. if you'd known, Catherine debated doing this whole thing black, this whole scene black. I love that. I love that. In the complete pitch black, and then cutting to night vision, black night yeah. vision. Yeah. And, and I thought it was That's a, a bold genius move. idea. I yeah. Because well, it's black. real. It's just totally real. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh man. Anyway. What a what a what a what a, an incredible director to work with. The varying scale of people that you have worked with is also something that I'm really impressed with because you're not only from the outside, but you come into this system called the Hollywood machine and you're working with these really incredible people, these talented visionaries. And I know, I, I know a little bit like on how other cinematographers work. I have, I tried to search and find some more with you. It's a little bit harder when you agree to sign on to a project, what's normally the process or is it completely different every time? Uh, I need to meet with the director, of course. I need to understand what, they're, what the type of movie they're making because, it, you know, I don't have to understand it fully. I have to know that I can get to the place where um, they are because I, yeah. need to, I need to make the same movie that they're making. Mm. And like, How do you I navigate into, that? You just over uh, food? Or? I use my instinct. I use my instinct. Uh, I read the script. I look at their work. Mm. I use my instinct, you know, and, and there are times where I, I, I haven't felt that um, I, I can bring anything to the project. Mm. And I felt that there were times where what the director was, how the director was approaching something wasn't something that I could get on board with. Mm. And that, that's just a, it's got nothing to do with, um, me directing the film in any way. It's just that I don't, don't necessarily understand the way he wants to make the film. And I don't think that I can help with that. There are probably mm. people that could probably help better than me mm. to do that. What, um, a hum, what a humble reply. But you say no yeah. more than you say yes, of course, there's no way. So I'm sure you get so no. many projects thrown your way and you have to kind of navigate you have a, somebody like a manager or an agent that screens this, these decisions I for have you? A, I have an amazing agent named Pete Franciosa who... Um, Shout out to Pete. 
Yeah. Shout out to Pete, <laughs> you know, and, and my commercial agent Robert. So, but but those mm-hmm. guys like they fall on grenades to, mm-hmm. for for their clients, you know. And but what I like more than anything is that they have taste. They have extraordinarily mm-hmm. good taste. Yeah. And um, in my again, in my opinion, but that's that's what taste is. It's an opinion. Yeah, right? it's, a, it's opinion. Yeah. So. Um, in my opinion, they have really good taste. In which case, they can help navigate all of those things in the in the Hollywood system. That when I came into the United States, I pretty much knew the differences were in Australia. I pretty much knew everybody that was making a movie. Mm. Um, I either knew of them, I knew somebody that knows them, I knew the project, I read the script. Like it's it's a small business, and it's a great yeah. small business with fantastically talented people. Super um, crazy talents down there. Yeah. But when I come in, come to the American system, it's like Australia times a hundred, and there are people who I never would meet. I don't know who are first timers, tenth timers, Oscar winners, whatever it might be, and they might be bringing a project up, and it might not be the right project. They're doing it for various reasons. Mm. Some people are making a film because they got to pay their um, their divorce. Some people are making a film because it's their passion project. Some people yeah. are making so you you don't know when you're a cinematographer which. Mm which horse to get on because you don't know, you might read a script and go, this is an amazing script, mm. but you don't necessarily trust the pedigree of the director or you yeah. might read a script. It's not a great script. But the director's incredible. So you mm. know what they'll do with it is, yeah. is right up your alley. So yeah. um, That's crazy. it's a, it's a hard Decision one. You know, I've, been, yeah. I've been super fortunate actually. I haven't yeah. had to sort of say home no runs. too many times. <laughs> yeah. You've been hitting home runs like just back to back. You know, I remember, I met James Chinlin. He's the our production designer on the Batman, mm. and I met. I went over to Warner Brothers to meet up with James. And shout out to James, incredible guy, shout such out to a James. talent. Yep. I mean, you two had to work like this in order to make that film work. Obviously, you and, and Matt as well, and everybody else that's attached to it. But I remember going there, and w- one of my favorite films, cinema wise, is Let Me In. And yeah. I knew that Matt and you had worked on that. So my question right to, to James was, is Greg shooting this? And he said, yes. I was like, oh my God. I, get, I just like, I lost, I lost it at, at Warner Brothers. Like, this is going to be so great. So it was so cool. It's cool that you've, because that film was a redo for, and Hoyt van Hoytemeyer shot the original one, right? The, so let the right one in, just, I think. Yes, he did. He shot Let the Right One In. So just for clarity, the film that I did with Matt, was not a remake of the film. It was a. It was a the American version of the book. So uh, the American version of the book. Uh, that's right. Yeah. I not a remake that, of the for, film. For, right. for, to not to lift or to diminish any book, sure. film, whatever. Purely just sure. to that. That's that's what the approach was. I believe from Matt writing the script. And it was definitely the approach that I had yeah. shooting it. And I even wrote to Hoyt because I mean, that was my first film out of Australia. And uh, and, and really? I wrote to him. Go, yeah, because I, I know I've known Hoyt for ages, and I wrote to him going. Hey, by the way, because, you know, if, if an American had come in to Australia and remade a film that I was really passionate about, a little Australian sure. film for the masses, yeah. I'd be a bit like, whoa, come on, man. Like, that's a bit, that's such a, you know, <laughs> power play. Like it, And so I wrote him and said, uh, listen, I'm making this film. Just so you know, I haven't watched your mm. film. All my friends mm. are telling me I have to see your film, yeah. but I'm so lazy I didn't see it. So good for me. <laughs> like, I didn't see it. And... <laughs> <laughs> but just so you're aware, like I'm making it as honestly as I can for the content that I have, and it's not. I uh, love that. You know, well, they're totally they're really different. Beautiful, beautiful reply back, and, and you know, uh, he's, a, he's a class act. Quite so. Yeah, he seems like a very graceful mm. person. Yeah, and his work shows yeah. it as well. But totally different, which is what I love. I love. I'll oftentimes watch those films back to back, even though that wasn't the intention to have them in comparison. But just to see how scenes are blocked and presented and rolled out the same themes, but kind of seen through different eyes, literally your eyes, which is so brilliant and also Matt as well. And I just knew and loving your work and Matt's work. I just knew that when I heard that you're doing the Batman, I was like, this is going to be fucking awesome. (laughs) I was so excited and it was such a great, yeah, it was, it was one of those really funny things that during the process of the Batman, which is, that's a weird problem process. When you're back here, you're back in, in Melbourne, you're working at Exit. We're going to jump around, so I apologize. <laughs> this yeah, it's, conversation like, it's like my brain. You're exactly <laughs> like my brain. It's perfect. <laughs> Which is good. It's good to keep it, you know, in a network. You're there. You're making a network. And then how do you go from 
being friends to people on set to going, oh, let me CA for you. Uh, let me, um, I'll work for you for free. Is that kind of how it worked? And then you started getting in there and then the short film started to evolve and then this all kind of happened or how did that a little kind bit, of evolve? A little bit. When I was, I think I was also a bit of a director's assistant for a while. I think I got a job there as a director's assistant. I thought I wanted to become a director and then realized that I, that's not my area of enjoyment. Um, yeah. But when I was shooting, I was enjoying it. So that was a really easy thing. I just went, I don't enjoy directing, but I love shooting. But, mm-hmm. you know, I was the director's assistant, which, or, and I was always there. I'm terrible early bird. So I was always up there at 7.30 in the morning or something, and I was always getting the fax machine came through with, you know, to attention X, Y, Z, like, and I have a little read as I put something on someone's desk. Mm-hmm and go, hmm, this is an interesting <laughs> story. And, or, you know, and, and I, I might have a little quiet chat with that director later on going, oh, yeah, I see that, that, that fact from that. Like, you know, like, <laughs> have, you, have you seen the photographer, this photographer, seen this reference, you know, or yeah. I'd kind of I'd, mm. I'd pull some of my books in and go, oh, I happen to bring some of my books in. Do you want to see some references? Because, again, like, again, you know, at that yeah. point, I'm 100% showing my age, but you didn't Google search something. You know, so I had yeah. bucket loads of books and stuff that I'd reference. Oh, have you seen that? Because this photographer, you know, like Nan Golden does this type of thing with a, mm. their lighting. I wonder if that was, you know. And then yeah. either what would happen is if it, if it had a budget, it would mm. go to a cinematographer that was established mm. and I would either help the director on whatever. Sure. Or if it had no budget and because I was cheap, I'd shoot it. So that was cool. Mm. Like I got to kind of shoot it or I got to watch a, a, a seasoned professional shoot something that I had worked with the director on mm. to develop a treatment and a style and mm. to see how that cinematographer took that information and, and changed it or uh, built on it or did something with it. So it was, it was a perfect learning curve. It was better than film school, much better than mm. film school because at film school, you, you know, I know you can watch and learn, and I did a bit of that, of course, when I watched every frame of Magnolia and just uh, studied yes. exactly we'll how talk every about frame Magnolia. moved. Yeah. And, you know, but at the same time, standing on set one day, watching a cinematographer work, and then the next day standing on your own set, having to make the decisions that, yeah. you know what I mean? Like it was, it was Crazy. the best school. Yeah. Well, the I mean, I always feel that learning is best done under the weight of a project. Like I feel like you mm-hmm. learn... I always say that your style is everything, all your failures that you've passed. And so your style yep. becomes all the things that you surpassed your failures, you know? So the way that you light things, the way you approach things. Um, I remember the first time really understanding what anamorphic was because I would watch films and go, why does this one look different from this one? I can't. And I figured, oh, it's this whole thing. And I was like, oh, I got devastated because it was this super expensive, high, like, you know, thing. And then I realized, oh, I can build my own. And so I went off and did that. And that was been really really cool i have like mm-hmm. it's in my system it's in my pelican case over here but i have this old like 60s projection kawa lens that i then attached like a spherical lens and then like a front variable adopter to do a full single put focus on it but okay, the so. image the, sh- the the center is really sharp and beautiful but the fall off and i love center focus everything anyway so i was like yeah. oh, this is great and uh, it was cool reading how you were finding the lens <sighs> language in a lot of your projects. And I think it was the Batman was one of the things that you got into. I love that you started this way. It's so inspiring to me and probably everybody that's listening to know that you didn't just have mom and dad pay for this thing. And then you found that person. It seems like you've managed to just navigate this water and it's easy to look at it from afar, just going like, wow, look at you've just kept winning. I'm sure you've managed to navigate this in a really, I mean, it's a high social game, really, right? It's a social, mm. how you interact, who you interact with, who you meet, how your friends, what do you network from that person? And this is one of the questions I wanted to ask was, how do you navigate being an outsider at the time coming to the Hollywood system? How do you navigate that? You have, you know, shields and. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think my agent, I think my agent deserves, a, again, another shout out there with well, that. That's a, that's a bit of a shield. My agents, agent, yeah. but, but I think. I think there's a certain level of ignorant bliss that can, goes on when you mm. when you. you I don't know, know. It's funny. It's funny. Like ignorance in youth can sometimes be dangerous, yes. and sometimes can be super, super, super healthy. Mm-hmm. Um, where 
you don't know what you don't know. Yes, right. And but you know what you want, and you know what excites you, and you know what's interesting for you. Uh, I don't know. I mean, that was that was that's pretty much the that in a nutshell. It's like, you know, mm. what 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 foot do I put in front of another? Like, what step do I take? And it was each mm. each time there was there was a few times in my career that I, I can tell you that there have been some hard decisions, you know, mm. where I've had to make certain decisions over some things, and I've always tended to touch wood, make what I feel in hindsight is the right decision, mm. you know. Um, yeah. You know, I've had to walk away from a, a project. I had to walk away from a project. I, okay, so going back, I've, I've I've seen enough of the business to know that it can eat people alive. I know that That's it can. Right. You know, yeah. in Australia, I saw families commit to doing a movie, and then the movie goes down. They've moved moved cities. They've put kids in school. They've spent money like, and they get they get two weeks pay, and then get told to fo. Like you know, so I've yeah. seen enough of. The, the 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 problems with our business where a corporation doesn't give two craps about your you know your fifth electric um you know rigger who has to make a life change to do a film because that's you know they don't care it, it's not yeah. that they don't care it's just that it's just a machine so well, they can't, I know they the can't afford to care almost in a sense you know no no yeah. no no, no. Yeah. so you know when i moved to Hollywood. I don't ever feel. I feel horrible, like a dickhead <laughs> saying that. When I moved to Los Angeles, because we lived in Venice, so we did, never lived in Hollywood. I've never moved to Hollywood. Yeah. FYI. So we lived in Venice Beach. <laughs> yeah, <I'm> so anti. <laughs> but yeah. but the, the the one thing that I made made a call on was that I would never ever ever fund through my own labor or my own stress or my own income a studio a studio's. Um, indecision mm-hmm. so if something wasn't going and it was it was like that bird in the hand thing you know what I mean like if something wasn't going I had another offer even though this offer was great and I should wait for it but this one like I've always tended to go uh, unless you can pay me and this is you know uh, uh, unless you can pay me because yeah. again that's what that's what talks sure. uh, I'm not sacrificing my time which is finite for, for, a, for a thing. So there was a project actually from a director who I really, really respect and love who I've not worked with yet, um, who I've had the chance to work with that, that was umming and ahhing and it was pushing and pushing and pushing. And there was a job that I was going to do with another director who I had a, a relationship with. It was commercial. So it was, mm. I gave up a film to do a big commercial. Mm. And the reason was <laughs> not because uh, of the money or for any other reason, it was for that moral mm. dilemma that I'd always planted a flag in the sand mm. and said, can you guys give us an answer on this? Because I'm about to screw someone else around. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, and I, it, everyone waited to the last minute and, and I eventually just had to make a call. Now, sure. that was one success. I met two days later, the film that I was on went down. So it never got made. Uh, so, you know, I kind of made the right call there. I know that's luck. Sure. And it's dumb love. Um, <laughs> I don't know about dumb. Seems like well, you, maybe. you will mean if you put the, if you on your threshold of life, if you put the flag in the sand and say, I'm not going beyond this bound because it doesn't align with my intention. That's actually mm. really smart. I think, I think a lot of people, I think that, and this is just my opinion, having gone through the machine, it's that the machine of Hollywood and films and stuff, it, it takes advantage of the misfit child. Basically, it's almost like, oh, uh, you know, I didn't get enough hugs, so like, you know, I'll do anything. And it's yes, that actually ruins the art because people are kind of killing themselves from it. And this is coming from a person that does so much of my own work and self funds almost all of my work and does collaborations with people and just saying like, if you want to collaborate with me, we can. And if not, that's totally understandable. So yeah, which is really difficult. Yeah, I mean the situation that you're in is, is 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 different in the sense that your own work, you you own. Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> and you yeah. should own, and you should keep ownership because that's where Sorry. it starts to become a bit of a problem. Where if you lose ownership, then you know. Or, yeah, I don't again, do it. So, I mean, ownership's a, such a weird thing. It's like not necessarily sure. ownership as in George Lucas, Lucasfilm ownership. It's more about <laughs> like owning control of yeah. its destiny. Like your child is the project. That's right. Um, as a cinematographer, it's a bit different because I don't have ownership. Again, it's mm. not a monetary thing. How it's does that affect just you a- as a creative like, member of it? Do you feel um, like, oh, I want more of this or 
you know, how does that affect you as a creative creative partner in a, in a project? I've got to say, I respond better <laughs> when I do have ownership and I do have sure. a say. Like in points opinion, on the film say, and stuff? Points. It's ownership. It's, it's yeah. again, it's that word. Um, Which is a great thing though, you know? It's commitment to its outcome. It's a, yeah. you know, and I do always as a cinematographer have that commitment as an yeah. out, to the outcome. Sure. But, but when you own something, and there's been a few films that I've had points in, mm-hmm. um, because that's, again, the way the Australian system works and, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, that's how they um, can afford to have such a talent on. They're like, we'll give you a piece of the value of this thing. Mm-hmm. You know? But ownership is really wonderful, especially for a dedicated artist, because you just go like, well, I'm involved in this and invested as well in the great, the, the better greatness of this thing, doing what it needs to do. Yeah. 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 Well, you're big so enough now, it, too. You could probably play that, too. Obviously, it's like, okay, well, I want this, but yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe, but that's where you know I, I need to be working on projects that that that, that um, I want to sort of also help birth as well, you know, yeah. and help build, mm. because you know I've I've worked right now to, with projects that have that have already have been given birth, and I'm mm. now working at the development of the child as opposed mm. to kind of the conception and the and the you mm. know because what interests me going forward is obviously cinema. I love cinema. Um, as probably I imagine most of the people listening to this do. Yeah. But what also interests me is not just cinema as it stands right now, but what cinema could be in, in 50 years or a hundred years. Yeah. Because, you know, if, if somebody had asked, let's, let's say we're doing this podcast a hundred years ago, obviously that's ridiculous because wow. it doesn't exist. The technology, tech let's, let's, yeah. <laughs> let's say we were, let's say we were, we were sure. sitting in a bar talking to each other in front of people, yeah. whatever the podcast of the day looks like. Yeah. Like, would we be talking about streaming? Would we be talking about mm. Netflix? Would we be mm. talking about the fact that you can watch a film and then pause it and then come back to it in, yeah. your, in your home cinema? Mm. Like, would we be talking about the, the different forms of like YouTube, YouTube Shorts, mm. Instagram Shorts, like yeah. TikTok, like all TikTok. these things that that, yeah. that are now media that people consume? Yeah, I don't think many people would have predicted any of it. And no, I mean, how could you? Know. I mean, look what that's what's happening with all the. I, I was showing you some stuff a while ago, but now I'm sure you're cowed on to it. All the AI art and the AI visuals mm-hmm. and all that stuff. I mean, yeah. Remember I showed you like months back. I was like, "Have you seen this?" Because yeah. yeah, I yeah, thought it'd yeah. be interesting. I didn't know if you guys had been using it or not, but yeah, that's a whole nother can of worms. I do love that yeah. your process now. I mean, let's we're jumping all over here, but we can't talk about the current project. Let's talk about maybe Dune and. How is it working with Denny? Do you do you sit in the room? I mean, I always I, I loved when I heard him and Roger, and then Denny speaks another language, which is the storyboard artist name or something. I can't remember his name, but he speaks French, English, and then whatever Robert or whatever his name is. <laughs> Did you guys yeah. sit and 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 kind of think about light and 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 how you were going to tell the story? How did that work? How to crafting the world of Dune? Well, June part one was interesting because that was our first project together. Mm. And, um, you know, I, I instantly got Denis. I instantly understood him. I love his – him being French-Canadian, he's quite passionate about uh, – French-Canadians are a bit like Australians. They're yeah. very, very passionate, mm. and they don't really mind who hears it. If, mm. if, if he's upset about something or – not happy about something and it could be the coffee machine it could be the 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 the, the, the lighting on a scene it, you know sure he, he makes his point but he's not he's not a uh, he's not a um an aggro making the point it's yeah. like yeah. it's not good enough it doesn't work that doesn't work this coffee machine is not good coffee's yeah. not good like we've got to get new you know like More binary whatever yeah exactly exactly and that's yeah. what's fantastic great, and i yeah I love that because you're yeah. never having to read between the lines. It's like you get the job done faster yes, right. when, when he knows, but, but, but the opposite yeah. side of that is, <laughs> is the passion for the good things as well. Mm. So, you know, you, you know, when something's good, it's mm. not like, yes. he's just saying that to make me feel good. You feel it in your or, gut. You feel it. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we got along really well, very quickly because, mm. I was quite blunt about my thoughts about things and he's quite blunt about his thoughts on things. Wonderful. So, so together we're kind of the blunt crew, you know, like, and it turns <laughs> out, this is funny. We didn't realize this until, hell, I didn't realize this until after we'd wrapped on June part one, but, um, we have the same birthday. Oh really? When's your birth? When's so, your birthday? 
October the third. Mm. So I, I think I got a me- I, I read something on That's mine or something on October third saying it's Denis Villeneuve's birthday today, like some star thing or something. And I was like, <laughs> "That's my birthday!" Oh shit, my birthday! <laughs> so I texted him and I went, "Is it your birthday today?" And he went, "Yep." And I went. <laughs> We share a birthday. So I think we discovered it after we'd wrapped. Wow. That's interesting. It's yeah. so crazy because you get so intimate. So you're, it's like, it's like the deepest relationship you could have. And then you don't know these, these things, you know, which is interesting because no. it's like a traveling so, circus. You're yeah. constantly just we never, going. We never, we had never celebrated, uh, our birthday. We hadn't been shooting during, mm. for June part one, mm. June part two, on the other hand though, we did. So that oh. was weird party time that was weird yeah <laughs> the dual like, birthday yeah well, some we, hazing we some the, birthday hazing some spankings and stuff no no <laughs> it's just like uh, it's already it's already like it's, yeah okay the director takes the spotlight for the birthday uh, okay <laughs> <laughs> forget about the dop in the corner yeah <laughs> that's no, the, yes yes exactly i, I, I remember point. hearing you i think it was like a commentary paul atreides is in the fog and he could barely read you could barely read him and I think you you said that Denny made a Ugh, like a sound like a guttural. That's and he, and I think that you, of course you want to please your director. And when you heard that, I, I remember hearing that just going, "That's the, that's what you want when you're collaborators. Yeah. You want to see the thing in your mind manifesting, and then let it move you so much that you have no words, just a guttural yes. rumble, <laughs> which is really wonderful. Yeah." No, it's, really listen, cool. it's very, what I love about my job, listen, what I love about my job is that I get to work with, um, different directors mm. who have, who respond differently to things, you know, like someone like Denis responds differently to someone like Matt, responds sure. differently to Gareth Edwards, responds yes, differently right. to Garth, you know, Garth Davis, mm. like to, to Catherine, to, to Ben, like everybody responds differently. Yeah. And so like trying to learn how, how, to read everybody's emotion mm. and to read Quickly. everybody's kind of like, yeah, it's good versus mm, mm, mm. like that. Is that okay? Or is that like hundred percent not okay? We start again or is mm. it kind of like, mm, it's okay. It'll be okay mm. in the edit because I'm not going to use like, mm. I mean, part of it, that psychology is trying to figure out um, are they, what are they saying? What mm. are those people saying? How do they, how do we get, how do we, read between those lines mm. are you mm. searching for the tell basically what body yeah. language and the in the form yeah because yeah. some people are direct about it like you said you like that with denny because it gets you there faster but not everybody is like that and sometimes i feel like i've encountered directors that really don't know what they want and you kind of have to think outside of what they're asking you and how do you navigate that too because you might have a scene where they're thinking oh in their mind's eye uh, there's this light from the left and blah 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 and you come to them, you say, no, the light's on the right. And then you have to navigate that weird water. You know, how, how do you, how do you do that? Like when you, um, I remember again, all of these thoughts are coming to my mind. I remember Denny talking about working with Roger and then on, on, uh, Blade, Ru- Blade Runner. And he was saying that he was arguing with his wife because he kept trying to get Ro- Roger to do something else. And then she said, he's better than you. Just let him do his job. And he was like, oh, like he was so humbled by the fact of that. But I think that's what you do as a director, as I imagine it, is that you bring on people to celebrate them and you celebrate together. And that celebration is the art. It's a collaborative art. And you know what? When you work with incredible directors, like I've had the very, very good fortune to be able to do, then you, you, that goes in reverse where you go, uh, you know, I trust their instinct. Mm -hmm. And very often the problem with instinct is that, it's very easy to, to look at something quickly and go, yes, no, maybe like you can, I mean, that's how I edit my photos. Like I've been mm. shooting photos on June part one and part two mm. on my yeah, film the stills. camera. That's right. Yeah. Stills. And you made the book yeah. with Josh, right? Didn't there was a book that you guys had done. Yeah. 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 Henry I've Hobson shot, was attached more. to it. So yes, yes. exactly. Exactly. Uh, Henry's awesome. And I've yeah. shot, he's amazing. And I've mm. shot, I've shot more. So therefore mm. it's like, well, right, well, what do we do with these? I love but, that. But to edit those things, like the way I edit them is I, I go through them quickly and mm. I use that first instinct. microsecond of instinct because mm-hmm. the second that your brain starts talking mm-hmm. to you, like it's, it's the it's worst over. thing in the world. Yeah. It's over, right? It's That's over. good to it's hear like, that. Yeah. That's good to hear that. Yeah. I often, when I travel, I used to get really angry when I travel cause I didn't have a creative outlet. I'm only happy when I'm able to 
just be an artist. I don't know what it is, but I started taking photographs and then I realized that there was two photographers. There was one that was on the street capturing the light. And then there, there's a one sitting up in the bedroom at night when my wife's sleeping, <laughs> it's like four in the morning and I'm editing and I only, I shoot it and I edit in the same 24 span and I don't look yeah. at it after that and I'm done. I'm like, Oh, and then I look back at it and go, Oh shit, that's weird that I did that. But yeah, fuck it. You know, like yeah. it's instincts and, and you got to trust that, you know, which I think is awesome. You on set bring a stills camera because I mean, on set it's brilliant. And I haven't got a chance to get that book. I need to figure out how to get a hold of that. But I, I, I don't know how you get it either. Cause that's the yeah, it's like super rare. Right? It was part, part of the special edition. I, I don't know how to get it for myself. Damn so, it. Yeah, yeah. Henry, so, hook us up. <laughs> I don't know if Henry can either. But yeah. it, there, are, there are plans afoot to try and figure something out. That's beautiful, though. I love that you're able to capture stills. That was one thing that I uh, did on my last film is I brought one camera with one lens, a 40 mil, and that was it. Mm-hmm. And I shot only black and white because I wanted to just capture that pure moment. Do you do the same thing? Is that why you started doing it? You start going, oh shit, like, this, this is so cool and capturing it, documenting it. Uh, it's it's funny because I actually didn't, I didn't ask to do that on June. In fact, it stressed me out a bit. Denis, I was, I was photographing, I was shooting stuff just for fun on my medium format or my 35 mil camera. Mm. And, and Denis had asked me, he goes, oh, you should do some stills on the film. And I went, oh, yeah, right. <laughs> Like I was going to operate the film and two stills. Like it was going to be yeah. a very hard job for me. Yeah. Um, and you're a whole guys. Goes, no, hold I'm on. Making my stills camera. Okay. Uh, yeah. Go. He yeah. <laughs> goes, no, I'm serious. I'd love you to shoot some stills. And I mm-hmm. said, I'll, I'll do it. Denis, mm-hmm. only if there's no expectations of mm-hmm. any, anything like beautiful. No one asks to see them. It's not going to be used for PR. Mm-hmm. It's not for any purpose. I don't want to be sitting there going, Hmm. If I took this over there, it'd be a much better show of the two actors having a good laugh with each other. Like it, 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 there'd be nothing in my brain that that was a commercial va- applied commercial value to the. Um, it's beautiful though to the stills. Yeah. Um. And so I was given free reign to 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 just photograph whatever I thought was interesting. And mm. there was some really interesting stuff on a film set that's not um that's not the standard you know, people having a conversation and a laugh and a this and a that. It's, film sets can be boring. Mm-hmm. Film a lot of standing. Can, a lot of standing. Films can be, film sets can yeah. be shit. Yeah. Like film yeah. sets can be actually, and, and again, I, I apologize <laughs> to anyone listening who, who does a real job, frankly, because I know <laughs> we are very fortunate in our world and I've it's, done real it's jobs. It's strenuous in a different way. It's cognitively it, it and also the time merit. People don't realize on a set is really, uh, it's monotonous and it's a war of attrition a lot of times. Yeah. It's, it's a high, and, and the thing is that everyone operates at a high level. Well, not everyone. There's a few key people that operate at a high level for a long time, Yeah. which 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 pushes adrenaline. I, I'm sure it's not that healthy to do it full time. Like, <laughs> because you're standing at the cold face of a movie continually. You, you're always at 100%. And right. to be at 100% like, requires, yeah. So... Um, anyway, so I like how you pass that, that over to be at hundred percent requires. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Yeah. Requires everything that Greg can bring to the day. Uh, Greg, everything the father, my, the husband has to be left yep. behind. It's great. The my aging body can give and my energy levels and mm. you know, my, my everything That's that I've so learned important. over 47 years of life. It, mm. But but with the stills, what I found was, mm. was some of my most interesting stills were some of the most, boring stills like one of my favorite stills is one of Stellan Skarsgård sitting in his white tent with his fluorescent light in his his baron suit um naked <laughs> just sitting there in his chair yeah. and he's just like just <laughs> boom. And, and it's beautiful I shot it on really old film that I didn't know if it was gonna work you know like scratches in it beautiful the, the, the camera wasn't great it's beautiful. And I'm like, I, that to me epitomizes the whole book. And in fact, sure. on June part two, which I may or may not have to finish shooting, um, I got a chance to show Stellan the book. He hadn't seen some of these images. And I was mm. like, it was wow. a real buzz. What showing. an energy that guy has. Oh, my goodness. Oh, man. man. And like, <laughs> you know, he's sitting in, in the Baron suit and I'm showing him some of these stills. And I was like, <laughs> dude. It, yeah. You anyway. seem very approachable on set. Everybody has a different energy, but it feels like if I was on set with you, we'd be giggling, laughing, working and operating at a highest level we can, but we would still be enjoying the process. Is that how it works for you, your crew? Are you 
jovial, but at the same time, very serious. And you know, what's, what's your question, tone? Actually, you probably should ask my crew. Cause I, yeah. I yeah. feel like I maybe am not as jovial as, as mm. either I should be. Sure. Well, the pressure, I feel like sometimes I'm a little bit too serious, but at the same time, like <laughs> you to focus, mm. I, you know, I feel like, I could definitely have a have a chat and a laugh, but but it's really I don't know. You should talk to my crew because I, yeah. I would like to believe that I'm that I'm pleasant. I'm definitely not an asshole. I, I, mean, I hope I'm not an asshole. Again, speak to my yeah. crew, but <laughs> don't I, say I, otherwise. I'm <laughs> oh, actually, I hope not. But, but I'm definitely not an asshole. But I can. Mm. I'm positive there are times where. I am less approachable than perhaps maybe I should be because well, of the high my pressure yeah. focus. Man. Yeah. 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 I mean, right. yeah. I mean, we downplay it, but it is hard because as you know, the nature of filmmaking is everything is against you at all times. Basically, you know, it's like, yeah. Oh, yes. the light moved. Oh shit. You know, yeah. like I didn't yeah. realize this until I started shooting and I realized, Oh, this is what this is. <laughs> oh shit. This is blocking. Oh wow. This is really, um, this is another thing. I remember reading an interview with you and I, I watched rat catcher because you had recommended it. Oh yeah. That's when there's five films. I think that were big influence on you. Rat catcher was one of them. I only got through half of it. It was really stark and wonderful, but I think you, what was the main inspiration for referencing that film as like a moment for you to like, Oh, this is like a, a tent pole thing to kind of give me inspiration. That film. Well, <laughs> that came up cause that came along at the perfect time for me and inspiration because Ratcatcher is consists of a series of stills, mm-hmm. and as a stills photographer, I knew stills. That's how I. That's how I saw the world. I saw the world in terms of Locked off frames, mm. and that film, for the most part, consists of quite still images that things happen in the frame and move out of the frame. Okay. So I watched that and went, "I can do that." Mm-hmm. Like it was a beautifully shot film. I mean, Alan yeah. Kusher did an incredible <laughs> job on that, and I still, right. I've not yet met. Oh, and, but I but I did tell him on the phone one day we were talking about crew and I told him how much of an impact that made on my mm. on my my life my career actually like, I don't know if I'd be a cinematographer if I hadn't seen that mm. film it just showed yeah. you that you could do it then it was a bridge I could do it mm. I could do it and, yeah. and not because I could do it better <laughs> no of course but not because everything I'd seen up to that point had been mm. cranes down dolly pushes sure. big complicated uh, theatrics with, when it comes to technicals yeah and like, you know, following people through corridors. So discouraging. Stuff that I can't. Yeah. Yeah, because it involves tech. Maybe yeah. then significantly different to now. Obviously, now we're talking Ronins. And, but back then, we're talking about yeah. you've got to get a steady cam off, you've got That's to right. get a crew. Like, yeah. you can't do it yourself. You used so, a lot of Ronins on uh, Lion, I think, too, right? A lot of, not only Ronins yeah, were around. Because but, we had to get the camera low. Yeah. Because yeah. uh, he was so small, and you had to keep with him. Yeah. He, he was at that. <laughs> unholy height that a steady cams hate. <laughs> oh, <And> my back. <laughs> it's like, you're not in low mode, you're not in high mode. Yeah. If you are in high mode, you go, can you go lower? And like, yep. And then <laughs> by the end of the shot, you're back up to the, and so we had to be, have the flexibility to be here on the kid because, mm-hmm. or Sonny, sorry, not a kid. That's rude. Yeah. <laughs> on young Sonny. He was what very, very good. Brilliant little actor. Man. Oh, incredible. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we need to convey that the difference between that and that, mm. It's massive, Huge, massive. Because horizon line too, and emotions too. Yeah, yeah. Do you so, freak you out know, about it, that it, kind of stuff when you're on set? You go, oh, drop it. You know, or do you? I mean, you operate a lot too, right? Yeah. Almost always, you're operating for the most part, right? Um. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't do steady cam. Uh, that's but. that's a whole other skill. I didn't realize it was so complicated. I put a vest on. And I was like, whoa, whoa. This is the way I'm doing this. Like casually, <laughs> this is like a thing. Yeah. A, lot of respect. a whole other <laughs> skill to DPing and yeah. um, and it's really tough because it's it's very, there's very few um, like operating is a massive skill yeah. and like to see the world not just technically but but aesthetically is mm. it's hard so there's only a few operators I, I, I work with you know and um, sure. that know you um, so closely right and it's it's not because I don't trust anybody it's just because i'm a bit of a, i'm neurotic and mm. you know like it's i can get a bit kind of a bit dogged when it comes to things so well you yeah. have a vision that's what makes you special you know i think which is great that, i mean that's just putting stock into it so i'm sitting there not knowing all of this but i'm just seeing it and going why does this shot look so specifically beautiful and, and understand it and i think that's 
because you're fighting for that. That's at least how I feel. I could be wrong, but just being an observer. I mean, I, I remember sitting, <clears throat> sitting watching the Batman. Every time I work on a film, I bring my wife. It's just her and I. We watch the film. And I didn't read the script. I didn't know what was going on. I had no idea about anything. I knew you shot it. And I was just, I was like, this is the best looking Batman film I've ever seen. I was freaking out because it was like, uh, it was amazing. And the car comes on and I start uh, shaking and I start crying. Uh, you, had, you had me crying. It was like, I couldn't what believe it. And, and And how you guys managed to capture the energy of that and it was it was because it's you know it's a nice blade where it becomes cheesy or becomes real and and it's a nice blade and you you guys right on it it was so i mean can you talk a little (laughs) bit about that process because i'm i don't know i'm trying to run back but i don't recall you doing a lot of car stuff that's a whole different thing right i think there was some stuff in zero dark 30 obviously and things like having a vehicle kind of move you around through things but yeah i mean that no, no that I've, never shot, I've never sh- ne- i've never shot a batmobile that's for sure <laughs> yeah i have shot cars and commercials and stuff so that's there's no did you know what the car looked like before you started to shoot it you i mean obviously you did but did you get a sense of like how the scale of it and the largeness of it and yeah yeah i think i don't i don't know i've done a study on the on the car i mean the car's you know i'll have to tell you the yeah. car is stunning like the car is stunning and <laughs> The lines on it and the 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 the, the home build that the, the story behind it is fantastic. Love that. So yeah. I, I've done I, I did a lot of studies on it and mm. photographically I recall I think there was a there was a teaser image that came out super early of of the Batmobile on the back lot mm. um, with Batman in it and I mm. think because I photographed that uh. I, I think and that was part of me and Matt. One Saturday afternoon, went to the back lot, <laughs> took the Batmobile, and we photographed every angle of it to um, to start to study it. Mm. And that became I do that's what, it's a good way to study something is photographically because then again going yeah. through you just flick through and go yep mm. yep yep like yep, the yep, focal no, length no, yep. and where it is and and how how to and make it look out big when it went, well, exactly <laughs> like you know is the front too big here is the back too big there like mm. I did the same thing if I if I photograph a car mm. I have I have photographed cars for money before like cars that try and sell you always try and find out from from the the person representing the brand what do they want to make they want to make the the back feel bulbous or the front like it's bulbous because if you shoot too wide then the front can feel too like too big yeah and not in proportion um and so you know through also with james's help too at that point in time james Mm -hmm. had been living with this thing for a long time so james is like you gotta shoot this angle yeah that's a cool angle (laughs) and then we tried different lenses and was like ah no it shouldn't be too wide we should be this lens and (laughs) and it becomes a this is why i love working on a film because Mm -hmm. it becomes like james let's use james as the perfect example like he'd had months to to study this thing that's right a model of it he had months to study it so i come in i've just seen it for the second time beautiful though you know i mean mm. he's got he's got skill and experience that i've i could only dream of because he's been looking at it for for for, for ages so yeah such an incredible yeah. team and crew thank you for that though uh i mean thanks to everybody that made that happen because i mean i watched that film in the theater 10 times i just kept taking friends come on come see this <laughs> and every time it's just like fuck <laughs> it's just, yeah it was such a it was such an event. Uh, it was a very special time. You know, I was on the plane uh, traveling recently and my friend was watching the Batman and I put on Nolan's Batman and Wally Fisker's version of Batman is so different too. And I thought to myself like, yeah. wow, this is so crazy. Like just the difference of use of light and the use of that system, which is so brilliant. It's really, um, it's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. What was really interesting about doing the Batman again? It maybe that goes back to also talking about what to work on. Let the right one in. Mm. Um, is that like of, of course I had seen the Dark Knight. Of course I had seen those films, and of course, but did you watch that prior to getting ready for this film? Yeah, no, that's gonna no, mess you again, up, huh? Yeah. Yes, hundred percent. Yeah, I actually tried to forget it as much as possible. Yeah, because yeah. it's it's it was so good, mm. and. I wanted to. We wanted to create something that was our own. With, yeah. Re, again, respectfully to the to, to to Wally and to Chris, like they made something that was fantastic. It will always be fantastic. That's right. Doesn't yeah. whatever we do, good, bad, or ugly, will never negate what they've done. It's a different so thing. We need to do. Yeah. 
so a hundred percent different. Yeah. When you go so we in, just came in, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Different references. We just came to it from different references, just from different places. You, it looks, it felt like you'd used a lot of painting references a lot of times with the lighting. <laughs> mm, yeah. I, what, what I'd done is I'd used a lot of urban photography. Mm. Um, like uh, it, to me, it was, I was calling it my urban noir because mm. it, it had to be dark, but it couldn't be oppressive and visually because you, you end up being unable to watch it. So there had to be light patches everywhere. Yeah. Um, so that as a as an audience member, you didn't kind of struggle to see. Um, you know, there's still, of course, complaints that it's too dark. But I, I you know, like for me, it's, it's as bright as a as a dark Gotham can be, particularly right. when everything set at nighttime. That's right. There's only two scenes at daytime, I think. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's yeah. it's 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 something that there's definitely a language to it and a beautiful language too, which I think is really amazing. One thing I'm always thinking about when I watch a scene, knowing that you're operating, is that. I, I think you said this about um, was it Channing Tatum when he was going ballistic in Foxcatcher and he oh, made yeah, you ill because yeah, yeah. his acting was so insane and you yeah. were in that room with him. How incredible! Because you're the first person to view the film in a lot of ways because you're operating, yes. so you're so close to the actor and working with well, such film, levels too. Yeah, on that film I was operating. I mean, it's sort of like Batman. Um, I didn't operate. Jason knew it because mm, it was just know. too big. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to concentrate on the lighting and mm. um, and, and Jason was available and he's a fantastic operator. So Wonderful. Like, you know, he was able to do it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, exactly. On something like Foxcatcher, you are, you, you are the first person, particularly that was film. Mm. So it was me and a sound recordist in a room with Channing. So the, the only person to witness that, the way that you have in the flesh is me through the eyepiece. You know, ever that'll never that'll not ever take that away from me, and that's the problem is that I witness something that's not on film; it's in the flesh and it's there, and the impact of the the, the fists in the in the wall, mm. you know, so emotionally yeah. and physically kind of affected me. So <laughs> he yeah, hurt himself it's a, it's at a that huge, time too, didn't he? With smashing his head, I think he had the, a little he, little cut. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I really do re- love and respect and admire actors that go all in. You know, it's 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 a weird thing to. to to do that for your life. You're taking your outside shell and you're kind of projecting it through things. And it's a really interesting life. Uh, having met and talked to some direct uh, actors, it's just like, wow, what a fascinating life you have. <laughs> yeah. And then for you, it's cool. You get to jump between these things. If you weren't doing what you're doing now, what would you be doing? Uh, mate, this is such a good question. I have no idea. I have mm. no idea. So you're perfectly I mean, aligned. You're doing what you should be doing then. Yeah, I in hell like I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, that's like asking me like if I was to retire and or change careers, what would I do? It's a great question, mm-hmm. and I have something I can't answer. But you're constantly moving, right? You're constantly moving at 100 miles an hour. Do you have moments like? And one of the questions I wanted to ask you is: Do you have any sort of hobby outside of this machine, which is filmmaking? Yeah. <laughs> but you have family as well too and I don't even know how yeah, you manage that well, exactly exactly I did buy a guitar mm. when I was on June part one and I have restrung it in the last three days oh, so okay. I plan on electric I plan acoustic on playing it it's electric but yeah. like again it's that type of thing it's like yeah. I need to I'm such a bore I'm so boring I need to get a hobby and do something other than making films well I mean it's you're in a very I mean in my opinion you're in a very unique position where you're at the up at the highest echelon so why not strike while the fire is hot and also um, capitalize on this different, this odd thing you're doing, which is working with all these crazy talented hundred percenters, which is so fascinating. Yeah. It's really, it's really something else. And you said that you didn't want to become a director. That was something that you kind of thought about and then realized. Yeah. What was no, it that told no. you that I'm not a director? <laughs> and my, my instinct, I just, I'm, it's a I'll, stressful I'll job. Be as, well, no, I don't mind stress. Yeah. I don't mind being scared. I don't mind mm. jumping out of my comfort zone. Okay. I just don't think I'll ever be as good as the people that I have worked with. Mm. And if that's the case, then I'll be always be a B grade director. Mm. So, mm. I mean, it's, it's not about ALB. It's just that I also just don't enjoy it. It's just mm. not my, my, I don't go home and study the work of directors to try and get better at what they do. That's not my passion and mm. it never has been my passion. Mm. And not to say that I wouldn't direct something because something might come along that I know I could direct and hit out of the park better than anybody else. That would be the, the thing. If I read something and went, I'm the only person that can do this, mm-hmm. 
or, or give it the um, give it what it needs, mm. then then yes, I might direct something. But mm. uh, yeah. And how often do you watch Magnolia? I know you got to go here, and I'll, and I'll wrap this up because I I, I could just talk to you forever. For yeah. I haven't seen it for a few years, but mm. I mean, every time it, if I see it somewhere, like if it's on a plane, uh, it's again, insane, I just that film. start up watch it. It's a, it's a, <laughs> it's a, it's an incredible work of art. I mean, it's a masterpiece. Yeah. Paul Thomas Anderson is it's a masterpiece. Yeah. He's a master filmmaker. Uh, I mean, yes. there'll be blood. Phantom thread was incredible. The, the fact that he's shooting a lot of his films makes me really excited as well. Cause then you really start to see what he's doing. Yeah. yeah. Damn it. Is he an, is he a director that you would love to work with? Uh, yes, with the same caveat that I had before. Like if it was the same, if I, if I knew I could help him mm. make one plus one equal three, sure. you know, as opposed to not like, yes, absolutely. Beautiful. Okay. Two last questions for you. Um, what are you most thankful for at this current part of your life? Um, I think my family, mm. you know, that, that they've, they've stuck with me and they've sort of helped me navigate this and being uh, understanding. Mm. I think that's a bit of a, you know, it's time to, to, to give back a bit more than I have. You know, I've obviously give back as much as I can, but times away have been tough. Mm. Yeah. Um, it's a very so selfish that, profession. Um, yeah. It's so selfish. Yeah. yeah. And, but it's so rewarding, like you just yeah. said. But so yeah. that's that, that. There's a bit of a change there, I think, for me right now. Mm, good for you. Yeah, yeah. That's mm. a big, it's a big shift. And then last question, something I like to ask everybody. And this is, I mean, obviously, I, I wanted to have you on, but my friend Anthony nominated you. Who would you nominate to come on and talk with me on this podcast? Who do you think that the audience would get a lot out of? Um, is there somebody that comes to mind that you think that should be on the show? I think Gareth Edwards. Oh man! Well, I don't know how to get a hold of him. You think you could link us up? Maybe. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, because I only know a couple friends that have worked with him. So, but I would love to. He, I actually there's a there's a talk that he did at South by Southwest. It's just one of the big inspirations for me to be a filmmaker. Um, he talks about how he failed so many times and was a phys effects artist, and then eventually came mm-hmm. on, and then he became you know, and then he went off and did Rogue One with you. It's just like crazy. So. Yeah. He's incredible. I mean, yeah. he's got balls the size of pineapples, that, that guy. I mean, look at, <laughs> look at monsters. Like, yeah. like, like that's just to do that all by himself. I mean, yeah. yeah. And the way Very they made it was beautiful too, how they would just shoot and yeah. kind of capture stuff kinetically and then the editor would kind of put it together and yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Greg, you're amazing. I'm so thankful that you exist. Thanks, I'm Ash. so thankful for the work that you produce and make and and your crew and everybody is, uh, I'm just a huge fan, obviously, and um, could talk to you forever. Thank you so much for sharing your time with me. This is an ultra nerd moment, and I'm so thankful to have it. So thank you for giving it's me. It's awesome fun. I mean, like, let's do it again. Let's do it again. Anytime point, you'd like. Sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You have a wonderful right, day. Thank you. Thank you, mate.